So one in three people in the Western world will develop cancer, and one in five will die from their disease, making this the most common genetic disorder. Today, I'm going to talk about an essentially new way of thinking about human, how human tumors progress with several clinical implications. So recent years have yielded many advances in understanding the spectrum of somatic alterations that take place in cancer genomes. And this is in large part thanks to major initiatives such as the Cancer Genome Atlas, which just finished sequencing over 11,000 tumors to the tune of about 20 petabytes of data. And ongoing efforts will continue to scale this up to some 25,000 tumors within the International Cancer Genome Consortia. So what have we learned from these efforts? Well, we've learned that tumors are incredibly diverse. And in particular, if we look here, what we can see is that there's up to a 1,000-fold variation in the frequency of somatic alterations across tumor types and even within certain individual tumors. We've also learned through other efforts that have focused on multi-region profiling of individual tumors, that cancers exhibit extensive intratumor heterogeneity. And so when we sample multiple regions from a tumor taken either from a primary lesion or a biopsy, we see that this heterogeneity occurs both with respect to space and time. We find that cancers exhibit substantial um, diversity just between clones, where we see star-like phylogenies. And moreover, if we molecularly subtype different samples from the same individual, as we have shown in glioblastoma, we find that they don't necessarily map to the same molecular subtypes. And so this poses fundamental challenges for how we move forward with precision medicine efforts. And so what do we know about cancer? Well, we know that fundamentally it's an evolutionary disease. Uh, we can think about clones as groups of cells that are related by descent and share a common ancestor. And we're really interested in understanding how these clones evolve over time, both in the treatment-naive setting, as well as in the context of different microenvironments when they invade and metastasize, and of course, in response to therapy. But there's a fundamental problem, which is that we cannot directly observe human tumor growth. It's obviously impractical. We can leverage the fact that these cancers record their ancestries in the form of somatic alterations that are inherited with each cell division. Uh, but really, back to the point, we don't know what happens in this early primordial tumor. Moreover, while we understand the elements of somatic evolution, and they're very well defined, we do not understand the underlying clonal dynamics. And I would argue that to date, our understanding of these processes has really been hindered by the lack of a quantitative framework, as well as a model of reference. And so big data alone may not be sufficient. We also need very careful study designs, and we need new theoretical frameworks to interpret these data. So let's move to the colon, which is the system we're going to be talking about today, for a lot of reasons, but the first being that it consists of relatively well-defined benign and malignant stages, where we can actually note the progression where we see these beautiful colon crypts in the normal colonic epithelium. Um, with the acquisition of somatic alterations such as KRAS, we see progression to an adenoma, onward to a more advanced adenoma with additional mutations, and finally we develop full-blown invasive disease known as a carcinoma. And early work from Vogelstein and Fearon back in 1990 really defined tumor initiation as being characterized by the sequential acquisition of alterations. Subsequently, this model has been used to describe additional stages in tumor growth where what we see is that we're not only talking about tumor initiation, we're actually talking about the successive path onto invasive disease and even metastasis. And so if we think about looking at this model in a different way, what we're really talking about is the accumulation of somatic errors with each cell division, whereby a cell with a particular fitness advantage can come to overtake or dominate the population by sweeping through it. And so we can imagine um, that we have a series of public alterations that are present before that first transform cell, followed by a series of private alterations that take place after transformation. And if we were to sample this tumor at any point in time, we would expect it to be relatively homogeneous, given that we observe these selective sweeps. But I would ask the question, is this really compatible with current cancer genomic data? In particular, does it fit with the extensive intratumor heterogeneity, which I just described? And so this gave us pause and really caused us to think about alternative possible descriptions of this scenario. And we proposed a Big Bang model of tumor growth, where the tumor grows effectively as a single clonal expansion 
populated by numerous heterogeneous subclones. And in the colon, this rapid exponential growth can actually take place virtually in the absence of spatial constraints because it can simply expand into a large lumen. So within this model, subsequent clonal expansions would be anticipated to be rare. We would be looking at the last clonal expansion. And moreover, even if they did take place, they would fail to homogenize the tumor population. And so as a result, not just public alterations, but also the majority of detectable private alterations would take place very early. So you can imagine that in this model, intratumor heterogeneity is absolutely intrinsic to it. And we would naturally see these star-like phylogenies, which is precisely what we observe in previous studies of colorectal tumors. So how can we go about testing this conceptual model? Well, we go back to the colon and um, What's beautiful about the system is that we can actually isolate pure glands composed of about 2,000 to 10,000 cells. They are devoid of, of stromal admixture. They're about 95% pure. We also know that in the colon, gland fission is the most likely mechanism of expansion. And so within this nice system where we're dealing with individual glands, this really facilitates the study of clonal dynamics because we would anticipate that even a small clone with a selective advantage could overtake the small glandular population. And so what did we do? Well, we sampled multiple regions of the tumor, separated by a minimum of three centimeters apart. We subjected them to various types of epigenomic profiling, and we did this looking across multiple scales, ranging from both individual glands down to the level of individual cells. And so this represents the most detailed characterization of intertumor heterogeneity to date. We were more interested in this context in actually characterizing the phylogenetic relationship between these glands um, as compared to cataloging the spectrum of somatic events, although that's also obviously possible. And moreover, we were interested in understanding the topographical distribution of both public and private alterations. And finally, as I'll go on to describe later, we wanted to um, understand quantitatively the underlying clonal dynamics. And so we developed a statistical framework based on a fully spatial computational model of tumor growth that takes as input the genomic data in order to infer various parameters of interest. So what do we see when we look at these data? Well, if we look at whole genome copy number, where it's shown here in a circus plot, and the outer concentric circle represents the bulk tumor from the right-hand side, followed by the individual glands from the right, and then the glands from the left and the bulk tumor. We're not only interested in characterizing amplifications and deletions, which we can obviously do, but moreover, in really understanding the topography of these events. And so we can certainly find events that are um, public or found in all glands. In this particular tumor, we don't see any side-specific events that are found in glands from one side only, but we do find evidence for side variegated events. And so these are effectively found in all glands from one side and a subset from the other. Similarly, we can find variegated events. These are present in a subset of glands from opposite sides of the tumor, as well as regional and unique alterations. And so what does this tell us? What it tells us is that the exact same copy number alteration is found in disparate regions of the tumor, three centimeters apart. And so we wanted to know, does this also occur at the mutational level? So to test this, we went on and performed whole exome and targeted deep resequencing of the same patient as shown here. And so what's plotted are allelic frequencies for particular mutations. And we can see in the first instance that we have a clonal APC mutation present at an allele frequency of one. That's because one copy of the other, the other allele is lost. But we also see alterations present that are mixed from opposite glands, so they're present in a subset of the right and a subset of the left, exhibiting these patterns of variegation. Again, the exact same mutation is found scattered throughout different regions of the tumor. Surprisingly, when we went on to look at benign adenomas that are not invasive, we find a completely different pattern. We find that these tumors all exhibit side-specific alterations. So again, we have a clonal APC mutation, but the other events are restricted to either the right or left side of the tumor. Again, purple and orange do not mix here. So scaling this up, um, if we focus here on these heat maps, where we're simply looking at a clonal alteration shown in blue in the top, uh, private alterations are shown in red when they're present or white when they're absent. We see no evidence for mixing between the right and left-sided glands um, in the adenomas. And again, in contrast, what we see in the carcinomas is extensive mixing. And so we go, if we go back to our model, we can envision that if we turn this on its side where distance from the center of the circle represents time from the origin of the tumor, we find that early events end up being pervasive and scattered to different sides of the tumor, whereas those that arise later 
um, may be restricted to one side or the other. And so one could imagine that if these events really do take place quite early, that mixing in a small primordial lesion could be highly efficient. And so this may represent a phenotype of abnormal cell mobility. So what do we observe so far based on the genomic data? Well, we've seen extensive genetic variegation and subclone mixing in distant regions of the tumor. We find that private mutations are clonal within a gland. We see that there's uniformly high intratumor heterogeneity at multiple spatial scales, and this occurs both between and within glands. Um, so really, while I didn't have time to show the single cell data, this suggests that there are no dominant subpopulations present. And this would imply, in turn, that clonal expansions are old, that selective sweeps are rare, and it points to the early acquisition of mutations and suggests that somehow these mutations can be scattered throughout the tumor. And so these fit with the predictions of the Big Bang model. However, we wanted to go back and actually infer something quantitative about the data. And so we developed this three-dimensional spatial computational model that can simulate the growth of a tumor up to 80 billion cells, or 8 million glands. And what we're interested in doing is comparing the simulated data with the observed data within an approximate Bayesian computing framework. And so we then go on to measure the parameters of interest, which in this case are the mutation rate, the mutational timeline, and subclone fitness differences. And so these are actually patient-specific parameters that we can measure from the patient's genomic data. And what are we most interested in? What we're most interested in is this mutational timeline. And so what we see is quite striking. Not only public alterations, but the majority of private alterations take place when this tumor is on the order of 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth cells. So this is on the order of 100 to 1,000 fold smaller than we can ever clinically detect these lesions using current imaging modalities. And it's far sooner than we routinely detect and resect them. So this suggests that, indeed, these mutations take place very early. These private alterations represent the full spectrum of intertumor heterogeneity. Moreover, we see that these early events actually dominate the genomic landscape of the final tumor. So we're really looking at an echo of the primordial tumor when we sample this full-blown malignancy. So what does this mean? What it means is that the Big Bang model can actually explain why we observe intratumor heterogeneity in colorectal tumors. We don't believe that every tumor follows this model. Um, in fact, it may be something that's quite unique to GI tumors. <coughs> what is clear is that the extent of intratumor heterogeneity is vastly underestimated. And this may pose obvious challenges for precision medicine. <coughs> in particular, late arising but potentially dangerous subclones may simply go undetected. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, what our findings also suggest is that some tumors may, fall, may simply be born to be bad, meaning that malignant potential is determined very early, and this opens up numerous avenues for earlier detection and intervention strategies. And so ultimately, we really believe that the quantification of these dynamics may inform improved prognostication and treatment efforts, and we can envision a future of precision medicine where we de de develop multi-scale models that span not only, only individual populations of cells, but up to populations of individuals, and take into account the full spectrum of omic data and phenotypic heterogeneity, really with the view of being able to not only predict, but also circumvent resistance. And so with that, I'll close and thank the many individuals in my lab who contributed to this research, as well as our collaborators and the funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you.